Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's operational information update on the flooding and landslide situation in BC. For today's briefing, we will have updates from Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General Mike Farnworth, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Rob Fleming, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries Lana Popham, and on hand for questions listening only is Armel Castellan, Warning Preparedness Meteorologist with Environment and Climate Change Canada, David Campbell, Head of the River Forecast Centre, Ministry of Envi Forest, Lands and Natural Resources, Ashok Batty, Executive Director, South Coast Region, Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, and Paula Cousins, Regional Executive Director, Southern Interior Region, Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. A reminder to media on the phone line, please press star one to enter the queue. You're limited to one question and one follow-up. I will now hand it over to Minister Farnworth. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm honoured to be here on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen-speaking people and the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. I'm joined today by Minister Fleming, who will be providing an update on the status of our roads. And our colleague, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries, Lana Popham, is here to provide an update on the people she has been meeting with on the ground who've been impacted by flooding. She's been working closely with farmers to hear about their experiences and losses and to ensure that they have what they need to recover. Our government is here to support everyone who has been impacted by these devastating floods, including our vital agricultural producers. We are now on the other end of this series of intense storms and the latest events were thankfully not as severe as forecast. Many flood evacuation orders and road closures remain in place however. The worst weather now appears to be behind us and I think we are all grateful for that. I'm happy to report that Environment Canada is forecasting more typical seasonal conditions for the next week. We'll see some precipitation but nothing as concerning as in recent weeks. And the River Forecast Centre is taking down many of their advisories with river levels expected to continue to drop. Throughout this event, I've spoken with many local leaders, including Mayor Braun of Abbotsford, Mayor Brown of Merritt, and Indigenous leaders across the province. And I continue to be impressed by their strength and leadership. Local leaders in impacted areas have been doing an incredible job of responding in real time to this evolving disaster, keeping their residents informed and their communities safe. The process of recovering and rebuilding is already underway and while it will take time, I'm confident that we will get there. Because of the outstanding leadership shown in our communities and the collective efforts of so many workers and volunteers, this includes members of the Cowitson Forestry, of the Cowitson Forestry Services, Canadian Armed Forces and BC Wildfire Service who have worked together shoulder to shoulder on flood protection measures to keep the Clem Clem Big House on Cowichan Tribes territory safe. There are countless stories like this, stories of public safety agencies, communities and industries coming together to make a profound difference in this response and recovery. Our top priority continues to be public safety. And with that in mind, I'd like to encourage all British Columbians to take steps to prepare and keep preparing now that winter is upon us. Pay attention to road closures and other notices on Drive BC. Continue limiting non-essential travel while conditions remain volatile and the fuel order remains in place. And make sure you've switched to winter tires and have an emergency kit in your car. I want to again thank British Columbians for keeping themselves and their neighbours safe. And all workers who've engaged in tireless efforts to respond and recover from these storms. We've already been through a difficult 20 months with the pandemic and I appreciate how British Columbians continue to come together to do the right thing. Now that this latest storm is behind us, we must look to, towards recovery, which will take time. British Columbians have been through a lot, and governments at all levels will continue to be here through this difficult time. Our Committee of Cabinet Ministers met again today to discuss the immediate and ongoing support needs of communities affected by the extreme weather events. And I'm pleased that we've convened a joint provincial and federal working group to address this emergency. While there is much work ahead of us, I'm glad that we have the federal government at the table. Again, but importantly, I want to thank all the crews, volunteers and everyday British Columbians who are working together to really move the needle on this response and recovery. With that, I'll now turn the update over to Minister Fleming. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Um, 
As Minister Farnworth has said, uh, now that we are through the worst of the atmospheric river events uh, over the past week that were um, <clears throat> predicted, uh, our focus in the ministry has already returned to rebuilding our network. This includes continuing with immediate repairs to restart or improve traffic flow. We're also continuing with the planning work for extensive rebuilds for those corridors that were most extensively damaged from the first storms on November 14th. I have some very good news to report on Highway 1 uh, through the Lower Mainland. The Tiger Dam across Highway 1 that had been a temporary addition to the diking system was taken down. It, it had been a highly uh, successful undertaking and it reflects the ex exceptional teamwork between Emergency Management BC and the City of Abbotsford. Our crews are right now just doing some final preparation and traffic will start flowing from Vancouver right through to Hope very shortly, perhaps even before this uh, news conference is over. Uh, I know this is very welcome news to many people in the region. I can't thank Fraser Valley and Lower Mainland residents enough uh, for their patience uh, over the last few days. I know it has been hard on people and families uh, as we worked to protect this vital highway, but uh, the results are very good and that highway will be open very shortly as I mentioned. The other section of Highway 1 uh, further east between Popcom and Hope uh, has now opened. Uh, there is, however, a restricted flow for about three kilometer stretch uh, near the Bridal Falls area and in that section all traffic is being directed over to the two uh, westbound lanes of the divided highway. Uh, traffic will flow with one lane in each direction. Uh, there is traffic control in place there and drivers do have to slow uh, right down and strictly follow the direction of traffic control people that are working on that highway. Uh, we will be working on the two eastbound lanes to get them back in service in that area. Uh, that will probably uh, require uh, an effort over the next uh, couple of days. Um, we're not uh, back to driving uh, normal yet, I want to stress that. Um, we are uh, relying on British Columbians to abide by fuel restrictions and so I would just take this opportunity that those of us who live in this part of the southern part of the province, um, if your travel is not necessary, please don't be out there just yet. But this is a very welcome development to have this essential corridor, Highway 1, open again for the movement of people and goods and I want to uh, express my thanks and appreciation to all the people who've worked relentlessly and tirelessly to get this vital corridor open. Talk about an all hands on deck approach. This was one that went into the early hours of every morning and overnight uh, to make this possible. I'm going to switch over to Highway 3 now. It remains open for our supply chain. Uh, this is the only highway uh, right now for large commercial vehicles to access the rest of uh, British Columbia from the Lower Mainland, so it remains under essential travel orders and prioritized uh, for truck traffic. Um, I want to take this opportunity to remind all drivers, um, especially truck drivers who may be unfamiliar with this route, uh, to please drive with care and caution uh, at all times. Uh, I want to thank the BC Trucking Association and individual trucking companies for working with their drivers to help familiarize them with Highway 3. This is for their safety and the safety of all other drivers using Highway 3 right now. There are sections where Highway 3, as we know, is steep and winding and drivers do need to slow down, but it's a safe route. Uh, it's been regularly inspected. It is safe, um, but anyone using it must drive to conditions at all times. We do have enhanced uh, winter maintenance on Highway 3 as well as added law enforcement uh, along the route. We can't uh, control the weather, obviously, but we can control how we drive and we need to keep Highway 3 free of accidents. Unfortunately, east of Princeton, Highway 3 uh, at this hour uh, remains closed due to flooding. However, the reports on the ground are that water levels continue to recede. The river crested uh, yesterday. Uh, we're hopeful that we can get that open at least to single alternating traffic as soon as possible. I'm advised uh, by the uh, later this afternoon. Other routes, Highway 20, Bella Coola to Williams Lake remains open. Uh, it weathered the storm events very well. It has been inspected and cleared and remained operational. Highway 99 is closed once again uh, between Pemberton and Lillooet uh, after a landslide that occurred last night. Uh, geotechnical engineers have carefully monitored this, co this corridor throughout the recent rains. Uh, we briefly opened the highway yesterday. We added uh, increased uh, patrols and spotters because of the heightened risk. There were some small amounts of material, material that were observed at which point the highway was immediately closed. And then during the night, uh, last evening, with the highway closed, a large slide did come down uh, near Duffy Lake and I'm grateful that 
staff were able to identify the concern, uh, act immediately, and ensure everyone's safety. Geotechnical engineers are on site on this stretch of Highway 99. There is a large amount of debris that needs to be removed before we can check on the condition of the road. So we expect Highway 99 between Pemberton and Lillooet to remain closed until tomorrow, at which point we will reassess and update the public. Um, we'll continue to uh, uh, monitor all highways that have been impacted by the multiple storms, and we will preemptively close any uh, as required uh, to ensure public safety. Last highway I want to just uh, update on is the Malahat, Malahat Highway uh, connecting Victoria with the rest of the island remains open to two-lane traffic with longer-term repairs uh, being planned. Um, there will be single-lane alternating traffic for a few hours tonight beginning at 10 p.m. Uh, that's so that we can increase uh, the, the safety and performance of the highway. We're going to put centerline delineators uh, to, uh, to be added and we're going to repair some sections of the highway to, uh, to improve its uh, safety. But it continues to perform well. We will also continue to update the public on the status of highways through Drive BC and specific travel advisories. So thank you very much and I'd like to introduce my colleague uh, Lana Popham, the Minister of Agriculture. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. I've been on the ground out in the Fraser Valley over the last couple days and I have continued to have meetings with um, staff, associations and directly with farmers. The weather looks to be a bit more dry over the next couple days which will be critical for removal of carcasses. Currently there are still about 819 farms that are under evacuation. We know at this point there are 628,000 poultry reported dead, 420 dairy cattle deceased, and approximately 12,000 hogs. And also of note, there is 110 beehives that have been submerged. The work by farmers and volunteers and companies uh, to clean out barns and to remove those animals continues to be extremely heartbreaking. And I request that folks remain empathetic and caring in their comments as they continue to do this very difficult work. I've been in constant contact with farmers through the latest series of storms and they're continuing to show their incredible resilience. We had about uh, 10 cattle liners lined up in Abbotsford um, over the last storm, but uh, that was gonna help with relocation, but they weren't needed, thankfully. Um, we are getting a donation, a many donation centers set up to help with feed and supplies that are coming in. Uh, having to find places for donations is a good problem to have. The generosity of people is, is exceptional. I met with the BC Agriculture Council on Tuesday and will continue to work closely with them to ensure that farmers are supported. They're gonna be assisting us with uh, dispersing important information to associations and directly to farmers. Uh, I just wanna really thank um, Stan, Rhonda, and Danielle at BCAC for working alongside us. It's very important work. On Monday, I visited the Abbotsford Emergency Operations Centre and I talked with staff who are set up right there in the community. There's also a dedicated branch of the uh, Emergency Operations Centre set up to assist uh, directly with agricultural producers. Our teams are really strong out there and uh, they continue to be at the other end of the phone lines. They are organized into teams in those rooms and the staff at the Emergency Operations for Agriculture are assisting with a uh, safe location of live animals where needed. They're supporting the feeding and on-site care, uh, on care for some of the livestock that are still uh, in areas of flooding and facilitating and removal of the disposal and deceased animals, of course. They're also ensuring that the permit system is working well so that farmers can get in, in and out of the evacuation areas to tend to their to livestock. Um, that work's happening in Abbotsford on the ground, but there's also work happening up through the Nicola Valley. About 60 animals have been moved and another are, uh, 75 are in the process of being relocated. We're also working with them to make sure that they've got enough feed to make it through the winter and that's going to be an ongoing challenge. Yesterday, I met with Minister Bebo to discuss agri-recovery package to help our farmers recover and return to uh, production. Our government and the federal government want to be sure that we have the most comprehensive package in place, so it's important that we continue to hear 
from people directly. My staff continues to reach out and we've had about 1,500 touch points at this time. The, the uh, outreach is going to continue to be important over the next number of months and most likely over the next year. In the interim, we are also allowing late participation in the Federal Provincial Agri-Stability Program for 2021. This program provides funding to farmers who have experienced declines due to crop loss or uh, livestock loss. The late participation means that BC farmers that are not currently enrolled for 2021 can now enroll uh, and they can enroll up to December 1st, 2022. You can get a hold of the ministry if you need that information. We're still in the process of quantifying losses, whether it be animal crops or plant crops, and we hope to firm up those waters as the waters uh, firm up those numbers as the waters recede. For blueberry producers, the waters reached depths of over eight feet, and some uh, are still under uh, quite heavy amounts of water. It's about 700 acres of blueberries in the Sumas Prairie. And we're not going to be able to know the full extent of the damage of those plants. But I did have a really good chat with Satnam Negra. He's been growing blueberries in the Sumas Prairie for 40 years, and he has 42 acres of blueberries. It was really important for him that the assessment not be done until about April, because it's at that point that the uh, berries will break dormancy and be able to show if they survived or not. He, seal, he feels quite hopeful because he said that a lot of his plants are under water on and off uh, every winter and so he feels that they're quite strong so we're going to keep our fingers crossed for him. Even though it's not blueberry season there's still plenty of opportunities for people to support our blueberry and all berry growers in BC. We estimate that there are about 7 million pounds of frozen blueberries in our system here in BC. And so if you want to do your part and, and uh, support our berry growers, go out and get some frozen berries from your grocery stores and buy BC just to show how important those farmers are to all of us. This evening, my federal counterpart, Minister Bebo, and I have a roundtable call with a wide range of agricultural producers and associations, so Minister Bebo can hear directly from, uh, from them what they need, and so that we can continue working on our joint federal-provincial response. Uh, we want to assess and quantify the damages sustained by the floods, and we're working with the utmost urgency alongside our federal counterparts to try and get that package organized. The stories we hear on the ground, they're harrowing and they're heartbreaking, but uh, as ministers of agriculture, we need to hear those stories to understand the full extent of the support that's needed. And uh, just to finish off, a farmer wanted me to let people know that the generosity of British Columbians is coming through loud and clear. He's lost his home and he was in Canadian Tire picking up a pair of gloves and a frying pan so he could make some breakfast. And he, um, a staff person came over and asked him to go to customer service. And when he got there, he was told there'd be no charge and they wished him well. These are the stories that help us all carry on. And these are the stories that will help us get back up and start again. Thank you. Thank you, Ministers. As a reminder to media on the phone line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You're limited to one question and one follow-up only. First question today is from Richard Zussman, Global News. Minister Farnworth, you mentioned that we're heading towards looking to recovery. What advice do you have people that are in affected areas in terms of where they can access the provincial resources? Is there a unified area where people can find out what supports they can get as we move forward. Yes, there are. In terms of the emergency uh, support services for those who've been uh, evacuated, it is uh, at the uh, BC uh, uh, flood response uh, webpage, uh, and that was uh, within EMBC, and there were, you will be able to uh, access all kinds of information for the supports that uh, are available to you if, uh, if you've been uh, evacuated. Follow up, Richard. We got an update yesterday from Trans Mountain. I'm not sure if uh, any of you have been briefed on this situation, but the expectation is we could have a reopening of the pipeline sometime soon. Is there an expectation now about when we may start to see that and what impact that could have on the gas supplies in the province? 
We did have an update uh, earlier today uh, on the situation regarding Trans, uh, Trans Mountain and the, uh, the pipeline. It is very encouraging uh, what we are being told. Um, with that being said, obviously we want to make sure that the, uh, the pipeline is, uh, is brought up safely. Uh, and so uh, uh, we are, you know, we're watching and, and in communication with TMX uh, uh, very closely. Uh, and when, as soon as we can lift uh, the, the restrictions, uh, we will do so. Um, as you know, it's, it's not just quite like uh, flipping on and off on switch. Uh, the pipeline does have to be brought up. It has to be pressurized. But I can tell you we are very encouraged by what we've heard so far. Uh, and uh, I think like uh, most British Columbians who have been doing an amazing job uh, in, uh, in, in conserving fuel and abiding by the 30 litre rule, uh, we are looking forward to be able to lift those restrictions uh, as soon as we can. Next question is from Dirk Meisner, Canadian Press. Uh, hi, I'm Minister Farnworth. Um, it was only a couple summers ago we were in Williams Lake. Uh, the, the place was evacuated due to fires. Uh, this summer there was the uh, fires and the heat dome. Um, now we've had floods and evacuation. I'm just wondering how with today, with today the weather kind of getting better, how you feel, your perspective on where we've been and where we, where we need to go. Uh We've been through an absolutely unbelievable time in this province uh, over the last few years when it comes to, uh, to weather. Uh, we have seen communities pummeled in a way that, uh, and British Columbians pummeled in a way that, that nobody should be. Um, and what I can tell you is, is I think all of us, uh, now that this, this weather event is behind us, are looking forward to, to rebuilding, um, getting people back into their homes, getting roads reopened, uh, everybody continuing to pull together to come out of this more resilient uh, and more uh, and, and stronger, uh, and building back uh, building back this uh, this province better than ever. Um, and I can tell you this: uh, the one thing that strikes you is we wouldn't be able to do this without the uh, the people of this province pulling together in the way that they have. Dirk, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, an another one for Minister Farnworth. Um, so. Do you um, have a sense of how many people overall throughout this, uh, the floods and the slides have been evacuated and how many are still evacuated and uh, the ones that are evacuated, when, when can people get back to their homes? So right now I can tell you that uh, the number of people who have been evacuated is just over 14,800. Uh, and that is obviously a significant number. Uh, the number of properties still on evacuation order is about 4,308. Uh, that's down a bit uh, from yesterday. Um, there are still uh, evacuation alerts uh, of the effect impacting about uh, 7,400 people uh, in place. Uh, so there's still a lot of people who have been impacted. But having said that, uh, as we've seen the, uh, the waters recede, uh, and the flood warnings removed, uh, that uh, evacuation orders are being lifted. Uh, in some cases, they're being downgraded, and we are seeing people returning to their communities. In the case of Merritt, for example, uh, we have seen uh, over the past week a staged reentry into the community uh, that is being done in about four phases. The phase one was the first, and people were able to go back, and phase two has already been completed. Uh, phases three and four dealing with the more uh, impacted areas of that community. Uh, so. People are starting to be able to return, and uh, I think uh, we're all looking forward to that. Mayor Baines, CBC. Minister Fleming, how soon are you expecting travel through the Fraser Canyon to resume to help alleviate pressure on Highway 3? And also, how concerned are you about the ability to stabilize the section of Highway 99 between Pemberton and Lillooette? Yeah, thank you. So let's start with the 99. Um, as I mentioned, it's closed because there was uh, overnight slide activity at uh, Duffy Lake Road. Uh, that's going to take a, a day or more to, to clear off. It was, I think, 2,000 cubic meters of material. We've got crews doing that work right now. Then we'll uh, assess the uh, road condition underneath. So we'll make that determination and uh, speak with you and other uh, journalists about that, uh, I expect, tomorrow. Uh, for now, that section remains closed. Um, we're also doing additional upslope inspections as well, just uh, given that this is an area without a history of slides, um, and, and nor did it have recent 
wildfire activity. Um, uh, we're trying to make uh, get a better understanding of, of, of that slide activity that we saw last night and of course the initial tragic slide that occurred. Um, in terms of uh, Fraser Canyon, both Highway 8 and 1, we're working right now with uh, the Ministry of Forests, um, EMBC, our road maintenance contractors, making repairs where we can, trying to connect additional Indigenous and uh, unincorporated area uh, communities there. Um, but uh, we do have, uh, you know, some in, some uh, small communities that are getting supplies by helicopter. We'll continue to use that as uh, the means to to get them the uh, the things that they need. Um, there's a couple of areas where they're you know, really connected by boat now. Um, it's going to be a bigger job. Uh, we'll have a more substantial update about what our you know plan of attack is around uh, Highway 8 and and Highway 1. But those are big jobs and. These are the conversations that we're having with, uh, you know, road builders and those who are experienced in that, and of course our federal counterparts. When we talk about disaster recovery, uh, that's one of the major areas where we've been briefing the federal government on uh, significant rebuilding activity that will be required. Mira, do you have a follow-up? Yes, um, and, and this next question is for Armel Castellan. Uh, what is the, the long-range forecast showing for a potential snow event on the south coast for next week? Please go ahead, Armel. Yeah, great question. Uh, we've definitely changed the pattern uh, fairly significantly since yesterday. We're going to come back to freezing levels that are much closer to seasonal at this point. Uh, we do see a little bit of a blip on Saturday. Um, it could bring some freezing levels down with a little bit of snow, uh, but probably not down to sea level. But we are looking very closely at Sunday night into Monday morning uh, has a, a better chance of bringing snow, particularly to the east side of Vancouver Island, but Howe Sound, Metro Vancouver, Fraser Valley, uh, the south end of Vancouver Island as well are definitely uh, in those crosshairs. So we will be evaluating that forecast over the coming uh, day and day and a half and, and in issuing uh, warnings for snow if, if it looks like it will be accumulating. Next question is from Melissa Tebow, CTV. Oh, hi there. Um, my question is to Minister Fleming. Um, I'm wondering if you could give just an overall picture of the size of the job to repair these highways, how many people involved, how many agencies are involved, just to really give a scope of, of the size of the job. Yeah, well, it's going to be a big job. When you add up Highway 1, Highway 8 through the Fraser Canyon and uh, the Coquihalla. Um, the Coquihalla <coughs> being BC's newest highway, about 35 years old, and uh, uh, failed in five sections currently. There's a lot of work that's going on right now on, on all of those highways to get uh, temporary restoration of use of those highways and then there's of course the bigger rebuild uh, and we've we've talked in previous briefings like this about the need to build back better. We're making those points with our federal counterparts that um, you know we're not simply rebuilding what we had. We need to have superior drainage systems you know account for um, climate uh, change forecasting uh, over the next many decades and the engineers that are uh, doing those assessments and gathering geotechnical information right now are advising us on what that looks like so I don't have a I don't have a cost amount uh, but it will be a lot um, I think the federal government is aware of that they've seen the damage as well uh, and um, you know we we, we want to rebuild as quickly as we can but we want to rebuild it right uh, to new higher standards that uh, are attuned to the realities of needing to adapt to, to climate change because extreme weather events like this are predicted to happen more frequently and uh, um, we, we, uh, we are working with contractors and those who are experienced uh, right now to gather their interest in helping us with a big, big infrastructure repair job. So we have among the best road builders in the world right here in British Columbia, we have so many qualified firms that are stepping up and expressing interest. It's, it's, it's quite overwhelming and, and heartening to see that uh, uh, working people in this province and companies that have built a lot of our roads and infrastructure are, are, are up to the job and, and wanting to get at it as soon as possible. Melissa, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, and I want to ask uh, specifically about the Coquihalla again. Uh, is the projected timeline of reopening by the end of January, is that is that still the goal or is, has that been reassessed in the last couple of days? That is still the goal and I'm, I'm pleased that we've, even with these rain events that we've just been through, We've had a uh, significant amount of activity going on there, heavy equipment, breaking up rock, making repairs, 
uh, taking down abutments that are damaged. So the work has never stopped even during these weather events and we've in some cases had night work occurring as well. So um, that, is the, that is the hope, that is the uh, timeline that uh, we're sticking with, which is uh, to have it functional likely for commercial traffic uh, uh, on Highway 5 by the end of January. Rob Shaw, check news. Uh, Minister Farmer, it's just a COVID uh, border question. The U.S. Uh, saying that starting next week, all foreign travelers, including Canadians, will have to get a COVID test uh, no later than 24 hours before their flight. And I'm wondering uh, what B.C. thinks of that and to what extent it uh, is surprised by that at all. Um, we are seeing, uh, obviously, with the new uh, Omicron variant, uh, nations around the world are taking uh, a variety of different steps uh, to deal with that in terms of whether it is restrictions, flight restrictions, border restrictions, or, or the requirements uh, for testing. Um, obviously, we want to assess uh, the, Im the potential impact uh, that, this, uh, that this may have, uh, but we have also uh, been working closely with, the, uh, with the, the federal government in terms of ensuring the ability uh, that our uh, transportation route uh, through uh, the United States for essential services through Washington State uh, can remain open, and they've been very cooperative uh, on that basis. Follow-up, Rob? No, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, Alana Kelly, Glacier Media. Uh, Minister Fleming, following up on Highway 8 near Shack and First Nation, can you say how long it will take to fix and if there will be an interim solution? We're working on an interim solution and we don't have a timeline just yet on uh, when, when that will be restored. Um, we are communicating with um, Shacken and other communities uh, on the Highway 8 route. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll have additional information as it becomes available. Um, I might ask um, Paula Cousins to provide any additional comments uh, because she may have some recent information there. Go ahead, Paula. Thank you. We are continuing, as the minister said, to work closely with the shack and community, sorry, as well as um, as well as other parties to get temporary to see if we can find a way to get temporary access into shack. And but as the minister said, we don't have a timeline yet, um, and we are exploring all options. Alana, do you have a follow up? Yes, the chiefs say that they're coming together to support each other from this area. So my question is, what is the province doing to support them? So we're working with multiple agencies, Emergency BC, Ministry of Forests, we have uh, side road networks, forest service roads. Uh, when Paula Cousins just said now that we're exploring all options and putting them all on the table, that's exactly what we're doing, is just to see what is the best way to restore access, the most immediate. Uh, and the most durable um, while we come up with a, uh, a finalized plan on what to do about a full restoration of the number eight. Peter Mitham, Country Life. Uh, good afternoon and thanks to Minister Popham for the uh, update on the agriculture sector. I understand a press release will be coming out from her federal counterpart in the morning regarding the situation and so I was just um, Hoping to get in here an update on agri recovery and just any possible timeline for when um, a substantial announcement could be made regarding that, and uh, also just uh, also in view of the um, some of the conflicting information that I, I seem to be hearing just regarding the number of farms evacuated. I, I think Agriculture Canada was saying 159 farms remained under evacuation order, whereas the minister uh, Minister Popham's number is quite higher. So just would love to hear an update on the um, collaboration and coordination between your two ministries. Sure. So thanks, Peter. Thanks for calling in. Uh, as I said, Minister Bebo and I had a conversation at 5 o'clock last night um, in preparation for a stakeholder meeting uh, tonight. And so <clears throat> we will be continuing to make sure that we get as much input as possible. But uh, that being said, um, our team here in BC has been working around the clock to try and identify everything and, and also to make sure that the scope of what is needed is, is very clear to the federal government and I'm confident that Minister Bebo understands that. So that's in process. Hopefully be able to have some news on, 
on that soon. And um, as far as the number of farms being evacu in the evacuation zone still, I think we still have about 819, but the waters are receding, so you'll see that number start to, to lessen up. But as far as I know today, we have about 819. Peter, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, and just uh, last last week we were hearing that um, from some ranchers in the Merritt area that uh, there hadn't been a lot of provincial involvement on the ground. And I know you yourself had said, Mr. Poppin, that um, weather had prevented you from doing a flyover of that area. So I was just wondering if you could update on how many of your ministry staff have been on the ground there and how discussions are going and touch points, as you say, with um, the ranchers in that area. Sure. Well, yeah, unfortunately, weather has not been our friend as, as um, we've been trying to access those areas. We're looking towards next week to be able to do that. But um, I don't have an exact number of number of staff that are working with the Nicola Valley and the Merritt area. But I can tell you that it's, it's all hands on deck. We have a really great contact there named Julia Smith, who is a rancher herself. And so we've been working with her for, to identify uh, crucial problems. And also the BC Cattlemen's Association, of course, has their network that we're working through as well. So, um, but as you know, it's a message that I keep repeating. If you hear of someone who's somehow fallen through the cracks, make sure they get a hold of the ministry. Um, that's the only way we can identify the problem and get to solving it as quickly as possible. We have time for one more question today. Mary Brooke, Island Social Trends. Hi, thank you. Um, so um, out there in the community today, uh, I visited about three grocery stores, which of course have depletion of eggs, yogurt, other milk products, um, and now other products that apparently aren't coming in because commercial trucks can't get through from, in one case, the warehouses in Calgary. So Minister Fleming, you just said that um, the Coca-Cola might uh, not be back up and running until the end of January. So we've got the Christmas season coming, and I'm just wondering um, if you can tell um, shoppers out there in, in different communities um, how they should, well, when the road might be back open, and Minister Popham, um, the, the food supply chain, yes, it's restabilizing, but basically how do we pace ourselves through this sh shopping season? Sure, yes, thank you for the question. Um, so the supply chains we've been able to reopen, and this is through Herculean effort, um, but Highway 3, uh, there's probably about 5,000 trucks that have been there. We, Highway 3 has not been continuously open, but we opened it many days in advance of what we thought was possible uh, because the condition of the road uh, was deemed to be safe and it was cleared earlier, but then through the rain events we have lost it for stretches of time. But about 5,000 uh, trucks have traversed through there. The uh, relaxations or exemptions for transit um, truck routes through the United States, uh, typically across northern Washington highways, uh, have successfully completed about 1,200 commercial vehicles that come back up into the interior of the province. Um, rail has been incredibly important as well for the supply chain of, of BC and Canada, uh, so having CP rail uh, up and running, uh, significant uh, enhanced uh, hours of operation uh, at the port um, to try and resolve that bottleneck is helping get uh, goods flowing in the country. And then, of course, we've never lost any connection with Prince Rupert, both the port there and the rail operation and the northern highways. And a lot of communities in the north are s typically supplied by um, food distribution centers that are based in Edmonton, some in Calgary as you mentioned, um, so we've had some temporary highway closures uh, for avalanche control by um, Parks Canada, which I mentioned yesterday, but uh, to my knowledge, uh, those uh, avalanche controls are completed and those highways are uh, reopened. So uh, basic message is uh, food and goods are on the way, they're on the move. We have thousands of trucks that are able to um, uh, use our highway system now. Thank you. And just to your question around the, the stability of our food supply and how do we all cope right now, um, I think our food supply, our food chain is stable and sound, but uh, we do know that there's been some delays. As uh, Minister Fleming pointed out, once um, trucks get into a line, it takes a little bit to get them going, but they're all coming to deliver food. Uh, I know of one incidence where there was um, one grocery store right here in Victoria that ran out 
bucket of eggs right across the street, the store had lots of eggs. And so my uh, message is to shoppers, be patient. Um, be patient with our retailers right now and be flexible in your shopping habits. There's lots of food uh, and you know another message I can give you right now is if people are having trouble getting out and, and getting that food, buy a little extra for your neighbor but um, we've got lots of food to go around. Thank you. Mary, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, um, Minister Fleming, you mentioned about um, drivers, commercial truck drivers who may not be used to these alternate routes. Um, being, having to be extra careful. Is there any sort of um, emergency or temporary training for drivers who might find those steep and winding roads more difficult to navigate? It's, the education around that is, is through companies and the BC Trucking Association. We've got a trucking roundtable uh, later this afternoon where we're going to get into some of these issues again. But it's, it's really just about driving to condition, to, uh, you know, expect it to be slow. It's still taking... Uh, from Surrey to Karameas about 10 hours, double what it normally would take. So it's slower. Um, parts of the number three are, are really good straight ahead, you know, through Manning Park, and some of them are steep and winding areas uh, on that highway. So it's driving to condition, being mindful that there are highway crews conducting repairs. So there are traffic cone zones. Um, we, we're doing everything we can. I mentioned today that we've got law enforcement patrols that are uh, enhanced uh, as well as uh, our CVSE staff, Commercial Vehicle Safety Enforcement, uh, out on the roads. Um, so it's drivers keeping other drivers safe. That's, the, that's the, the, the watchword for those using those roads. We've made it a commercial vehicle uh, route right now. Um, so we're, we're working with the trucking industry to, to, uh, to, to, to work with drivers to be familiar with that highway because it may have been sometime since they've, they've driven on the number three, they're used to the number five, but they're getting used to the number three now and we've, we've got it well signed, well flagged and uh, we inspect it regularly and it's in safe condition. But it, to, to remain safe and to prevent accidents means drive to the conditions, drive to the reduced speeds. That concludes today's update. Thank you for joining us.